is Messi! It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. It's time for the biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, are top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world, in front of any player in the world, and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport. Let's join the team for the biggest show in the world of sport on CFM Stereo. My station, your station. It's a Wednesday, everybody, and it was supposed to be the introduction saying, Cricket is back! But my goodness, it was delayed because of the weather. Yes, indeed, an international sports year, Ben Stokes is well aware he will have an extra responsibility leading England in the first test against the West Indies at Southampton, a match that has marked the return of international cricket after months of coronavirus enforced lockdown. Waiting for such a long time, it's not a headache to wait a little longer because of the weather stoppage. Uh, That's one of our stories. But we always start on the home front. And the team to deliver that and so much more on the show today are Chris Gray, Mike Madoda, our producer Sean Tafirinika, and my name is Barry Manandi. Well, what can you look forward to on the home front? The Zimbabwe Rugby Union intends to use the current period of inactivity, which has been prompted by the COVID-19 pandemic, to restructure the national teams ahead of their World Cup and Africa Cup campaigns. And around the world in 60, we start in Australia, where New Wallabies coach Dave Rennie remains confident his first international assignment will be against the All Blacks in Wellington in October, despite the COVID-19 pandemic. In Switzerland, tennis ace Roger Federer says the coronavirus lockdown has given him time to ponder his future plans and admits he has had to consider whether he wants to keep going after two serious knee operations in 2020. And we touched down in England where the Open Championship will be replaced by a virtual tournament that will see players from different eras competing against each other, the Royal and Ancient Golf Club of St. Andrews has said. We then have our play of the day. Today is Wacky Wednesday, so don't miss out on our musical interlude that comes smack bang in the middle of the show. And then the second half is the beautiful game. Kickoff is in Serie A, where AC Milan coach Stefano Pioli said he was not thinking about the future after his side beat Serie A leaders Juventus amid widespread reports that he is set to be replaced by German Ralph Ratnick at the end of the season. In the Premier League, Frank Lampard was frustrated with Chelsea's lack of control during the thrilling 3-2 victory at Crystal Palace in La Liga. Barcelona have reassured Antoine Griezmann that he will not be going anywhere this summer according to reports in France and in the Bundesliga Borussia Dortmund have set the deadline and price tag Manchester United must meet in order to sign Jadon Sancho. The Warriors, the Chevrons, the Cheetahs, the Mighty Warriors and the Sables. From the pool to the track to the field, we are Team Zimbabwe. The Home Front. Local sports news and analysis. You can catch us on social media at Mike Madoda, at Chris Meadzi, at Sean Tafirinika, and I'm at Barry Manandi. But the handle that you need to know and definitely follow across all social media channels is at ZFM Sport, and that includes YouTube. Let's start with our local sports news roundup. It's rugby today, where Zimbabwe Rugby Union intends to use the current period of inactivity, which has been prompted by the COVID-19 pandemic, to restructure the national teams ahead of their World Cup and Africa Cup campaigns. The union will be taking giant steps in implementing the vision that they have had, that of identifying and appointing coaches who would help introduce a playing system unique to Zimbabwe. Both World Rugby and Rugby Africa have often noted that Zimbabwe's game is long on potential, but very short on delivery. Let's first hear the comments and a few brief notes from Simba Zanga, who's the Zimbabwe Rugby Union Communications Manager, before we hear from the team right here on ZFM Sport. The Zimbabwe Rugby Union 
has started the process of restructuring all its other national teams or rather all its national teams starting right from the Sables which have been restructured and its um, technical team announced. The main reason why we are restructuring is to try and revamp and revitalize and maybe reinvigorate uh, the different national teams and refocus them towards the vision that the executive has and the executive currently has the vision of having our high performance teams taking part in um, in tournaments on the world stage for example the cheetahs must must attain core status the sables must qualify for the world cup and we must improve on our rankings with that in mind all the other teams and their objectives will also be to filter into the national senior teams the cheetahs and the sables Z. Well, Mikey, uh, the Zimbabwe Rugby Union are beginning to take a few leaves out of the playbook of Zimbabwe cricket and use this uh, coronavirus uh, lockdown to try and do some stuff. And it's very welcome, isn't it? Yeah, it's very welcome, Barry. Uh, I like the noises and the sounds that are coming out of Zimbabwe Rugby Union. Uh, it shows that uh, there is some thinking that is going on behind the scenes and they're going to try to utilize the time that they've been given by the coronavirus pandemic to try and get the game in order. However, I have my misgivings uh, in terms of them talking about establishing a brand of rugby that Zimbabwe can be identified with uh, because that's a process that needs to start right at the base of the triangle rather than at the top so you establish a style you establish a brand not at the sables not at the cheetahs not with the lady cheetahs you establish it with our young schoolboys who are starting off the journey of playing rugby that is your six-year-olds your seven-year-olds your eight-year-olds who are playing coach rugby at the different primary schools around the country That's where you get the brand going. That is where you teach the kids how to play rugby and not just teach them to play rugby, but teach them to play in a certain way, which is the Zimbabwe way. So the question I would be asking is, do we have the coaches in place? Do we have the coaches in position that can teach these kids to play rugby, the so-called Zimbabwe way? And what is that Zimbabwe way? Has established what that brand of rugby is? Has anyone articulated what it is? What is our style? Because if these coaches are to go and teach these kids how to play rugby, they've got to be very clear about how and what style of, uh, of rugby we're teaching to these kids. Is it rug- running rugby, ball in hand? Are we taking the physical robust approach that we see in the Northern Hemisphere with sides like England or with the Pumas in Argentina? Uh, or are we going to be seeing that, that running rugby that we see in Australia and New Zealand? What is it? Has anyone defined it so that it's very clear from the onset? And uh, Mike makes a very important uh, um, assessment there. The fact that it's got to be at the base of the of the um, rugby pyramid, isn't it, Chris? Because um, there were some noises on uh, social media when the announcement came out that this exercise was starting, but the technical setup at the Sables was being unaffected, meaning that Brendan Dawson and his technical team was remaining in place. So it shouldn't really matter that Brendan Dawson is carrying on, carrying on with his job. What is possibly important is the fact that the technical committee, which is headed by Bright Chivandire, is leading a process that should go down to the grassroots and make sure that we have that style. Definitely. And I think that process needs to start with a discovery, like Mike said, of exactly what the style is, exactly what is the style, what's going to work in our advantage, what do we have at our disposal, um, what are our players, um, what, what, what's more their inclination, what's going to work for Zimbabwe rugby. And like you said, in terms of where this impact is going to start, it's supposed to start at the bottom. But if you take a look at Zimbabwe rugby, we don't see a very clear stream of feeding, for example, schoolboy rugby into the rest of Zimbabwe rugby. And those are the structures that they need to be working on to say, okay, in as much as we'll be teaching this um, particular Zimbabwean style to, to, to the schoolboy level, how do we make sure that all of that talent doesn't, first of all, just leave? And how do we maximize on it to ensure that this goes all the way right up to the stable? And that's where I think they might have a bit of trouble because obviously we understand that a lot of... Um, 
our schoolboy talent leaves the country and very few of those players are actually willing to come back and play for the Sables and for the Cheetahs. So it's it's going to be tricky for them and I applaud them for this decision to actually say we need to establish our own way of playing but I think we want to see we want to see it actually happening. We hear a lot of good sounds every couple of years from Zimbabwe rugby and we we, we praise them for their efforts but we don't see in effect what some of this decision making um the actual impact on the ground and that's what I'd like to see from Zimbabwe rugby is less talking more doing let's see once you've got a Zimbabwean style of rugby let us know what that is and what it looks like what your structures are going to be looking like we want to see the actual progression because we have this discussion now and in 6 months time in fact 6 months to a year's time we we've sort of lapsed again and we're getting new statements from Zimbabwe rugby so we'd like some consistency and we'd like some doing less more doing less talking Mike, you're a big fan of uh, uh, funnels uh, and indeed the pyramid. So the pyramid exists for uh, how we are playing rugby or who is playing rugby, and then the funnel existing for uh, sifting out the quality that then gets uh, to the sables level. In your view, are we playing enough rugby? We know rugby is your favorite sport. Are there enough people playing rugby so that we are getting the best of the best, the best and the brightest, ultimately ending up? at the top of the of that pyramid or the bottom no i don't think we, we've got uh anywhere uh, near enough uh, people playing rugby uh and uh, that's mainly because uh, rugby of late has started to compete uh with uh sports such as uh, football football in fact has really made a dent the world over uh cricket is the national sport of australia uh they have been suffering their reports that have come out that they are suffering uh because a lot of children are gravitating towards football because uh football is big on tv football has got uh, more marketing dollars so kids are seeing lionel messi is seeing cristiano ronaldo they are seeing eden hazard and they want to be like neymar those are the players that they are seeing constantly uh on sports shows the world over so the challenge is similar here in zimbabwe football is our national sport a lot of children will gravitate towards football mainly because football in terms of numbers is an easier sport to play you and i barry grew up in the era where it all we needed was just um, a few pieces of plastic uh and uh so draw so, <laughs> you know some string to to to, to, to try it or tie it all together and an open yep. piece of land and sometimes it just needed to be a concrete slab as long as there was enough space uh for you to actually have a kick about would have a kick about and yeah. it's different i think uh with rugby uh as far as the the tackling is concerned so it has to be a certain surface that you're playing on etc and also in terms of coaching the the way that rugby is played is very different from football football is very easy for any child to understand kick the ball forward score in between those two rocks it's very yes. clear in terms of very easy in terms of what you're trying to achieve whereas with rugby Barry you remember when we started playing rugby and I started playing rugby in in, in grade 3 uh yeah. is that it took a while to understand the concept that oh, you had rugby, to pass yes. the ball backwards backwards, backwards. Uh, yes. etc and, just and, you know that, and, just well, that alone well, yeah just that alone was confusing pass the ball backwards yet you're trying to move forward, forward. so you, yeah. you, it it needs coaching it needs people who pour themselves into these kids so i take a look at the numbers that we have now i think more can be done barry to harness uh, the physical ability and uh, that we have in let's say uh, some of the peri urban and rural areas where we have a lot of kids who are very athletic very quick very strong naturally strong because of the rigors of life every day by yes. day uh, <laughs> i i remember we had a guy called uh, Tawombera Maso he yes. came to uh, to Jameson for his a level uh, he had never played rugby um, ever before but within a few weeks he was playing first team rugby and wow. in his second year he made Mashonland country districts because he had all the natural attribute he was a big fella he was quick he was fearless and so he had it all he just needed to do was to be taught the game so i'd love to see a scenario Barry where we are doing more coaching clinics in areas where kids don't have coaches and don't have the the technical know-how and we're going in there and trying to find some of these kids in the ghettos in the rural areas and giving them scholarships to go to better schools where they're able to play rugby weekend week out especially during the winter season 
and growing the base of that pyramid is going to result in one thing the more people are playing the more we are likely to discover can, can, can i just give an example there can i give an example russia i think they have now said that um sevens rugby is part of the school's curriculum what have we seen over the last two years we have seen russia become a core member on the servant second so it it works yeah. you just yeah. need to be deliberate about some of the policies that you instituted because they've grown the base of the triangle in russia in terms of the kids that are playing sevens rugby and the results are showing new zealand is a nation one of the smallest nations in the world and yet because they they get everyone playing rugby from the age of 5 it means that they actually have a very large pool of kids to pick from when it comes yes. to uh representation for their schools and for their franchise or provincial sides and that pool in new zealand uh, sometimes is actually bigger than bigger countries isn't it chris and uh, yeah. in truth Zimbabwe rugby union doesn't have to reinvent the wheel because Zimbabwe has such a robust educational program uh, and every child must be educated every child in inverted commas and and I use every very loosely but every child almost is going to school so the schools is where we ought to begin get rugby into the schools and likely you will get rugby at the the top of the pyramid as well Definitely and I think that's where the coordination comes in when we talk about um basically the ministries communicating and seeing where they can actually collaborate and where they can contribute if the ministry of education gets together with um the ministry of sport and coordinates this program that means also you having the minister of finance jumping in there and also affording the funding to be able to do some of these things which i think is a big factor it's 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 really great for us to say we'd like to get corpus to jump on board but i think we need to get the zimbabwe rugby structures and the organization itself um coordinated enough for someone to be able to say yes I'll put my money on there. So I think we're going to need we're going to need it's going to be a really top down approach. We're going to need the leaders right at the top to jump in and let's get this thing going. Hi, this is Alexandra Maseko and I'm the national basketball team captain and you're listening to ZFM Sport. Z All right, let's give you some local sports news starting with basketball where the Harare Basketball Association disciplinary committee are expected to determine the outcome of a disputed match between leaders Harare City Hornets and rivals Foxes played in December last year. The outcome will likely decide the title race. The 2019-2020 season was halted by the COVID-19 regulations with six games to play. City Hornets lead the men's league table on 34 points at point ahead of JBC while Foxes are a distant fifth on 20 six points in cricket news tuskers a national cricket team all rounder sikandar raza but is excited at the prospect of being the first zimbabwean to play in the caribbean premier league the cpl the pakistan born zimbabwean batting mainstay is expected to leave the country on the 2nd of august to join his teammates in trinidad and tobago raza is part of the trinbago night riders squad released by the cpl in a virtual show aired on facebook the 2020 cpl t20 championship which is subject to government approval is expected to take place in Trinidad and Tobago from the 18th of August through to the 10th of September. We're wrapping up with news out of the top tier of local football that's the Castle Lager Premier Soccer League where some of the premiership clubs feel the preliminary costs associated with the possible return to football action are too high for them. One of the key recommendations is that each club's players and officials must be tested using the recommended PCR test which costs 65 US dollars per test kit. The South African clubs are paying for the testing of all their employees. Highland his chief executive and Tlantla Duwe say the time had come for a review of some of the costs which clubs must pay. Hi, this is Mike Madura and you can catch me and the team for all the latest breaking news out of the world of sport local as well as international on your favorite station, my station, your station, ZFM. We are Z team on ZFM Sport. Z from the front of the grid to the back of the net it's ZFM Sport International Sports News Roundup where the world comes out to play 
Time to go international with our sports news, uh, but a reminder of what you can expect a bit later on in the beautiful game. Big, big result out of Italy, but is it big enough to influence the title race? AC Milan, the Rossoneri, getting the better of Juventus. Come from behind victory, and what a fantastic performance it was. Pity Alois Mungira is not on the show because it would have given him a bit of hope as to there is still a bit of fight in the league as far as Juventus' domination is concerned. But we'll get to hear the thoughts, of course, of Barry Menandi and Chris Gray a bit later on. But before we get them, I want to hear their thoughts on the cricket to where Ben Stokes is well aware he will have an extra responsibility leading England in the first test against the West Indies at Southampton. A match that has marked the return of international cricket after months of coronavirus enforced lockdown. The pressure of captaining England for the first time with regular skipper Joel Root missing the match to attend the birth of his second child would have been enough to concentrate all round the Stokes mind in normal circumstances but the first fixture in a three test series has been given added significance by the pandemic let's hear from Ben Stokes um, well I think first and foremost I think the, it's great that cricket is back uh, it's great that cricket is back on TV um, and you know I know everybody's been craving it um, you know, we've been in lockdown now for two weeks and um, I've been very impressed with the way that the lads have just cracked on um, with the amount of change um, that we've had to deal with. Um, and <clears throat> I think tomorrow couldn't come at a better time. You know, everybody's um, ready and raring to go. Um, there's only so much training you can really do before, before you start uh, not getting bored, but start... Um, getting a bit frustrated that um, you're not out on the park um, but today's been a really good day I think everybody's got back into their routines that they normally would do the day before a test match Z. Barry rain wreaking havoc on the south coast it's not the ideal start it's not what we wanted would have expected that at exactly midday Zimbabwean time Central African time the first ball would have been bowled and test cricket would have been back but it looks like there are going to be some teething problems as far as the return of the game is concerned and uh, those are of uh, weather variety Indeed, um, but uh, I suppose uh, the old adage says delayed is not denied. <laughs> so, listen, we're, 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 we're happy that cricket is back, um, even if it means that we have to wait a few more hours or whatever the case may be uh, to actually experience uh, the action on uh, the, the, the square and on the field. Um, but I think the, 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 the point being that uh, the work that has been put in to get cricket back must be applauded just like how it took the, uh, time and effort to get football back I think cricket was a little uh, complicated as well because of the um, I was about to say bodily fluids but then that sounds like I'm talking about something totally different uh, but you know things like <laughs> the, uh, the spit shine of the ball <laughs> the spit shine of the ball and elements such as that needed to be dealt with uh, obviously it returns without fans which is again hardly ideal but as long as it's on our screens I think we're all happy we're all happy that uh, cricket is returning. Chris Ben Stokes has been chosen to lead England. And uh, he's a guy who's, listen, not shied away from controversy over the last 24 months. Uh, he had to go through that court case where he was being accused uh, of um, uh, bodily harm. What is it? GBH, grievous GBH. bodily harm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where he's supposed to have assaulted a fellow patrons outside a bar. I think it was in Bristol. Uh, and mm -hmm. so he's a guy who's, who's overcome those challenges off the field of play, gone on to perform heroically last year at the Cricket World Cup and during the Ashes, and now he gets to lead England. And you've got to say that over the last uh, 12 or so months, he has exhibited maturity beyond expectation. Definitely. I think he's um, come up in leaps and bounds, especially he won that BBC Sports Personality of the year and that just tells you the kind of turn that's happened in terms of public opinion in terms of what he's done as a player in order to perform for England and um, I think that's what makes the difference and just him being able to pick himself up I'm not sure he'd, he imagined that he would have um, been leading England at the moment but the fact that he is I think is a testament to how far he's come and what he's done to actually overcome and to focus on his craft essentially and that's what will um, continue to set him apart 
While the side on tour is the West Indies, a side that dominated world cricket in the 70s, in the 80s, and right through to the mid-90s before they handed the baton over to Australia. Let's hear from the skipper, Jason Holder, who is delighted that cricket is back. Oh man, I've been sat at home for the last couple of months doing nothing, so... <laughs> I'm happy to be actually getting some cricket back in and you know, doing something I love and, and have loved doing from the time I started doing it. And I think most of the other guys are feeling the same way. You know, We haven't had competitive cricket for a while and we don't even know what's going to happen after this series. <laughs> so I think it's an it's a opportunity that we should all grasp. Um, again, we've all made the decision to come over here, not being forced. And, we do it because, or we've done it because, you know, we want to be here. We want to play cricket. And we've been assured um, that the measures put in place are, are, are going to be carried out to the to make us feel that much more comfortable in, in what we're doing. And again, so far, I must com- commend the ECB because everything so far has been rolled out perfectly. And once it continues that way, I can't see, you know, um, much interference coming in, in play uh, with, with regards to the series. So, um, to, to, to just to just summarize in a way, you know, we're happy to be here. You know, I'm personally happy to be actually playing some cricket. You know, not many other nations can boast of it. So I think we should relish the opportunity. Z. Right, Barry, this uh, West Indies side, it's a far cry from the legendary sides that uh, had the likes of Sir Viv Richards, Brian Lara, Kirtley Ambrose, Malcolm Marshall. But it's a vastly improved side. I mean, two years ago, we were wondering where West Indies cricket was going. Now there is some direction and it's a side that will pose uh, perhaps a stern challenge to England on tour. Yeah, it's a, it's a side that uh, the transition took a little bit longer than we 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 expected. Um, we saw them do make that phenomenal performance in the I think it was a T20 World Cup uh, a couple of uh, uh, seasons ago, uh, and we thought that this is the right direction. And then we didn't see the kick on from there. But now, certainly under uh, Jason Holder, uh, who is an exemplary leader, which is what we're used to in terms of West Indian uh, uh, cricket, where the, the the leader of the pack actually puts in the performances as well. So I think this is a team that's now we're about to see those green shoots that we saw so promisingly a few seasons ago begin to give their fruit. So it's a vastly different side and it's one that's going to be very competitive. Chris, and in terms of cricket, just uh, finding its place back in the hearts of sports fans in the 90s with so many rivalries, you know, we had uh, Australia versus England, Australia versus West Indies, and of course, Australia versus India, India, Pakistan, West Indies, England, uh, you know, rivalries of that nature. It's important that West Indies are playing well so that we have more and more of those rivalries because it can't always be Australia versus India or (laughs) Australia versus South Africa would love to see West Indies get back to where they were so that we can see the West Indies versus Pakistan pace uh, attack uh, rivalry. We can see West Indies versus England uh, and so forth. So we want to see West Indies doing well in world cricket. Definitely. And I think that's what adds the... um the, the entertainment value in as much as we can have um, these ODIs we can have the teams playing but I think those rivalries especially for West Indies are critical in terms of basically just catapulting them back to the status in which they were while well, the Asia's Bowl will be hosting its fourth test match since its debut staging in 2011 and it's its first against the West Indies of course the previous opponents at that ground have been Sri Lanka and India who have played there twice it's bound to be a good one and I'm sure on a Monday we should be giving you the result of the first test between England and the West Indies Hi, my name is Sean Williams, Zimbabwe cricket captain. You're listening to ZFM Sport. Z. Around the world in 60 seconds. International sports news. Around the World in 60 is proudly brought to you by DSTV. We take off in Australia where new Wallabies coach Dave Rennie remains confident his first international assignment will be against the All Blacks in Wellington in October despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Officially a week into his role, the former Chiefs coach is still a month away from being able to join his new team on the training pitch in Australia. Rennie told Sky Sport his sole focus is October the 10th, which he remains adamant will be the first Bledisloe Cup test date in Wellington 
even though details of the Trans-Tasman series are yet to be announced. We head over to Switzerland where tennis ace Roger Federer says the coronavirus lockdown has given him time to ponder his future plans and admits he has had to consider whether he wants to keep going after two serious knee operations in 2020. The 20-time Grand Slam champion has already confirmed that he'll not play again this year after the second knee surgery in March and now he has told GQ magazine that he is contemplating whether he will make a return to court in comments that will be viewed as evidence that he is contemplating retirement. We touched down in England where the Open Championship will be replaced by a virtual tournament that will see players from different eras competing against each other, the Royal Ancient Golf Club of St. Andrews had said. The Open for the Ages, as it will be called, will see current players such as Rory McIlroy go up against legends such as Jack Nicklaus after this year's Open Championship was cancelled due to the coronavirus pandemic. The virtual tournament will be played through a combination of seamlessly edited archive footage, the modern graphics and commentary with the winner decided through a data model based on career statistics and voting by fans. Hi, I'm Clemens Matau, Chicken in Midfield. You're listening to ZFM Sports. The big leagues, the big teams, the big players. The beautiful game on ZFM Sport. The Neratsuri. The Black and Blues, Inter Milan. It's Romelu Lukaku, and it was never in doubt. He's a beast at the best of times, but this season he has become a monster. The Giallo Rossi, the Yellow and Reds, AS Roma. Belotti has a go. Tremendous hits. That's what he's capable of. La Viola, the Purple Ones, Fiorentina. Brock Ribery seals a glorious win for Fiorentina with a sumptuous goal at San Siro. The Bianconeri, the Black and Whites, Juventus. Ronaldo seals yet another three points for Juventus. Tough yet colourful, the best of Italian football on Z. Right, let's get the beautiful game on the road with news out of Italy where AC Milan coach Stefano Pioli says he was not thinking about the future after his side beat Serie A leaders Juventus amid widespread reports that he's set to be replaced by German Ralf Ranek at the end of the season. Juventus missed the chance to take a big step towards a ninth successive title in a 4-2 loss to the Rossoneri. He's quoted as saying that Stefano Pioli, I just expect to concentrate on doing the job I was called to to do. I can't waste energy thinking about situations that are not up to me. We have to get our energy back and think about the next game against Napoli. If you didn't watch last night's encounter, AC Milan 2-0 down early on in the second half. Goals by Cristiano Ronaldo. And what's that French boy called, Barry? (laughs) For the second one. Rabiot scored the first one, of course, and then Rabiot scored the second one. But then uh, AC Milan hitting back with four goals to complete the comeback. Zlatan Ibrahimovic getting the comeback on the road with a penalty that set the tone for Juventus' capitulation. Now, if you take a look at this situation, what a way to respond, Chris, uh, by Pioli. Uh, You know, so much speculation in the media about his job, whether he's going to keep his job, whether the German Ralph Ralph Rannick is coming in. But he's managed to get two of the biggest results of his tenure so far in successive games at the weekend 3-0 over Lazio who are in second place and now 4-2 over Juventus the team that's leading the race for the Scudetto Definitely. And I think that completely just blows the expectations that he's going to be leaving the club at the end of the season out of the water. Because if he's able to produce results like this against Juventus, who's been on a brilliant run, then I I think you'd have to be a little bit crazy to just continue with those assertions. I think he's trying to cement his position. And anyone who had any doubt after last weekend and after last night as well, I think you'll be looking at that. It's an incredibly convincing result for two against Juventus who have been playing brilliant football and were on a run um, to secure their next title. So I think these are the kind of results that he needs to produce in order to um, kind of quieten the naysayers. Barry, what happened? 
2-0 versus Juventus, that's normally curtains. That's normally a uh, job done for the champions. Uh, they are cantering to uh, three more points and possibly more goals in the game because that's how we expected it to go. We thought to Juventus, two goals early in the second half, they're probably going to score a couple more goals and win this mm. one convincingly. But it was uh, AC Milan that scored four. It was, um, and it, look, some, someone can think that it was it was uh, uh, almost a Juventus capitulation. But I think it was a momentum game. It was very watchable. Let's let's start there. It was a fantastic game of football. Yeah. But that penalty seemed to be the place where it sort of swung. Uh, the penalty that was that was of course uh, converted uh, by uh, the old man Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Um, and then from there, it was the AC Milan players that sort of rose to the occasion. You can't point to a single player who didn't show up. A lot of the times, AC Milan, depending on Antti Rebic, uh, uh, Chalanoglu, they, they, they look towards those players to do something. But this time, you were Bonaventura, fantastic game. You had uh, um, the young man, Rafael Leao, uh, phenomenal game. They, they, they all rose up and realized that they could take the game by the scruff of the neck. A game they were well in it, even though they were 2-0 down, and then managed to, to overturn the scoreline. So for me, it was almost as if they were saying, we love Stefano Pioli, yes, and we're willing to play for him. But <laughs> if Ralph Rangnick, Rangnick is coming in, we're, this is going to be our dress rehearsal and we're showing what we <laughs> can achieve as players. Uh, Chris, you know, Barry has mentioned uh, a lot of names, uh, players who are astounding, uh, outstanding, but I thought, I thought the most outstanding player was uh, Ismail uh, or Ismail, uh, as they would uh, pronounce it probably in the Arab world, uh, Ben Asser. I mean, he is a guy that a lot of people don't know much about. But I thought he was absolutely fantastic. He dominated central midfield. He didn't seem to be in awe of sort of like the bigger and better players uh, that are uh, at Juventus. And uh, his combination with Kessi uh, was absolutely something to behold. And um, perhaps the, the, these are performances that AC Milan needs to build on and not necessarily look at the big name signings, but more players who are willing to play their heart out. Definitely, and I think that's what that's what sets certain teams apart, especially now where in terms of what they're looking at their squad for next season, they can't be expecting to buy too big. I think if you we take a look at those valuations for certain players across Europe at the moment, they're incredibly high. All of these clubs have been hit by the coronavirus pandemic. So taking a look at those players, especially your younger players who, when given this opportunity, they absolutely maximize the opportunity and make a difference for the team. I think that's what they need to build on, whether they keep their current manager or uh, get another manager as well, then these are some of the players they need to be looking at as players they want to retain and players that they want to grow with. Uh, so it could have been a pivotal night in Serie A had things gone the way of Lazio, but unfortunately they had contrived to lose in the earlier kickoff versus Lecce. Despite taking the lead, Lazio went down 2-1. Tonight's action in Italy, Fiorentina, La Viola, they'll welcome a Cagliari, Genoa versus Napoli. Torino versus Brescia at the Bentogodi. Bologna will welcome Sao Suolo. Roma have Parma visiting the Eternal City at the Olympic Stadium. And Atalanta will take on Sampdoria looking to extend their winning streak. And then tomorrow night, Spa will take on Udinese. And Verona will entertain Internationale. We move to England now where Frank Lampard was frustrated with Chelsea's lack of control during their thrilling 3-2 victory at Crystal Palace. Goals from Olivier Giroud, Christian Pulisic and Tammy Abraham ensured the Blues took the points from an end-to-end -end London derby. But it could have been very different. Kepa Rita Balaga was forced into a wonderful fingertip save to deny Scott Dan before Christian Benteke was thwarted by Kurt Zuma's last-ditch challenge in the 96th minute. Let's hear... Uh, well, they're, big. they're big because of the position we're in. We know it's tight um, in and around us, and uh, it's nice mentally to be third for maybe a short period, but that's what it is. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think we, the game could have been more comfortable for us tonight, then we could have lost those three points and probably got one at the end. So um, maybe at this crucial period, it's nice to dwell on the three points, but my job as well is to look at ways that we can get better, and we still can. I felt in midfield, considering the quality in our midfield and the 
first half, first 60 minutes. Today wasn't our greatest day. We didn't, uh, we weren't as slick with the ball as we had been recently at times. Uh, gave them an opportunity to press us and turned over the ball a little bit. And with Ruben, I felt that he could carry the ball with his strength and he can always protect it. And with Tammy searching for a goal, I've used him and Ollie in different parts in this in the restart period. Um, and I felt that he always had that, you know, those legs at that later stage in the game where he can run them the other way a little bit and he gets his goal, which I'm really pleased for Z. Frank Lampard, they're frustrated with his team, but um, I think if we look at the glass being half empty on the Crystal Palace side, uh, great fighting spirit by the, the, the Eagles there, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great fighting spirit. I didn't expect it uh, when uh, Chelsea, so like when 3 1 ahead, I thought Chelsea would pull away. Uh, it looked comfortable at that stage, but we saw the fact that, uh, listen, when Wolf Zaha is on form, he's able to create something. Uh, and he's able, of course, just to uh, get defenders back paddling. And that's what he did. You know, offensively, uh, they were able to get their game going, especially in the in the first part of the second half. But I thought when um, the master stroke for Frank Lampard was uh, bringing on Jorginho, Jorginho hasn't had a lick since the return of football. And it surprised me somewhat because Jorginho was their best midfielder uh, before their he break. Was. He was the most outstanding player that they had in central midfield. Wasn't used at all in the games uh, leading up into this game and we saw his quality when he was brought on because all of a sudden Chelsea were able to wrest back control from Crystal Palace and they were able to start dictating uh, the pace in central midfield. He's a very good user of the ball, short and long. Uh, and uh, I thought, listen, Frank Lampard is perhaps missing a trick in not deploying him uh, at the heart of uh, Chelsea's midfield. And it showed because he brought uh, absolute control. Apart from uh, the injury time period where uh, Crystal Palace, you know, at that stage, you know, a team is desperate, a team is pouring forward. They're trying to find an equalizer and uh, they created two, two chances. Uh, I thought they should have scored at least one of them, uh, yeah. but uh, they were unlucky and Chelsea got the three points they needed to stay ahead of Manchester United in the race for Champions League football. Is that the name of the game, Chris, for, for, for Chelsea going forward in the sense that um, Jorginho coming in, providing that stability and balance uh, in that midfield, but perhaps that's emblematic of where Chelsea needs to be. We're hearing now news uh, filtering through that they are the front runners uh, to sign Kai Havertz, uh, albeit that they haven't agreed on the on the tra- transfer price and are unwilling to pay uh, the asking price, however, are the front runners. Is it that Frank Lampard needs to find that balance between the youthfulness of his squad, but also the experience? Jorginho, very experienced player and a campaigner who can deliver in measured and balance, uh, uh, in a balanced delivery. And that's possibly where Frank Lampard needs to find that balance in his squad and make sure that he always uh, puts a team that has the right mix. Definitely. And you'll find that because Chelsea at the moment are trying to secure that Champions League place, um, they need that experience. They need the players who know what to do when they get into tricky situations, like they were with Crystal Palace yesterday. You need those players who know how to grab um, those three points in every single game. So that's what you'll need to establish in terms of blooding in all these youngsters. I think it's brilliant for Chelsea because what it does then in terms of the longevity, in terms of um, Chelsea going forward, they're not buying as extensively as they would need to. But in terms of that experience, it's definitely needed, especially because he has such a large group of younger players who in certain scenarios might not have the street sense to know what to do. In other results from last night, Watford beat Norwich 2-1 and Mikel Arteta claimed Jamie Vardy should not have been on the pitch to deny 10-man Arsenal victory over Leicester with a late equaliser in a one all draw at the Emirates. Arsenal head coach Arteta insisted Vardy should have been dismissed for kicking Shokran Mustafi in the head as he fell following a first-half challenge between the pair. Vardy escaped punishment with the incident seemingly deemed accidental by referee Chris Kavanaugh and not reviewed by the video assistant 
referee. Well, I think Arteta is right, game. Barry. Uh, I, I, I think he's absolutely right because uh, that should have been a red card. And we see more of this. You know, where, where, I, previously I've talked about um, institutionalized racism. Uh, within mm. the refereeing structures in England and it shows the way they treat England stars or English stars compared to the foreign players is vastly different if that was David Luiz who had done that that's a red card and he's off make no yeah. mistake about it if that's Fabinho who does that it's a red card he's off if that's Matic who does that it's a red card he's off but because it's one of your glory boys you know one of the English boys you know one of your your Vardys your Canes your Rashfords uh, your Trent Alexander-Arnolds they allowed that petulance and it's it's for me it's not fair uh, on yeah. some of these uh, foreign stars because the referees have got to be uh, they've got to play with a straight bat and for this not to even have been looked at by VAR just shows you that it's a problem with the referees it's uh, it's concerning that uh, certain incidences that are, should be referred to VAR, at least be reviewed by VAR, are not. And yet, in the case of Edin Ketia, when he was given the red card, while well, a yellow card that was turned to red, the referee, and I believe did the right thing, went yeah. to look at the monitor on the side of the pitch. So it should have been 10 against 10 at that stage. But instead, because it the, the laws of the, the game, card. Barry, they don't talk about accidents. Yeah. They talk about endangering the safety of a fellow professional. Whether Correct. you do it accidentally or not is not part of the deal. If, even if you kick him by accident, okay, it's a red card. So yeah. that I didn't mean to do it is, is not part of the defense. Accidental is not part of the, yeah. Edin Ketia didn't mean to do what he did. Exactly. He he was going for the ball, but he was still given the red. He were, had that yellow card was overturned. So why? Because he what's did it. Good for the goose. Exactly. What's good is yeah. what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and we want a little more consistency when applying the rules of the game. Let's look at tonight's matches. Manchester City entertain Newcastle. Sheffield will take on Wolves, while West Ham entertain Burnley in the late kickoff. Brighton will take on Champions. Liverpool. Tomorrow night, Bournemouth versus Tottenham, Everton versus Southampton and Aston Villa will take on Manchester United who are in the form of their lives. You would think that this is Sir Alex Ferguson reloaded. Heading into La Liga now, Barcelona have reassured Antoine Griezmann that he will not be going anywhere this summer. According to reports in France, the £108 million striker has been linked away from the Camp Nou, having failed to find any sort of form in what has been an underwhelming debut season at the Catalan club. However, it appears his fortunes may have turned after club official told the Frenchman that they have a lot of faith in him and that he will not be sold. And this is according to French publication Let Keep. Barry, for you, Antoine Griezmann, obviously he hasn't done what you'd expect from a 108 million pound striker. There were reports that he's going to be moving away from the club, but we see this turnaround from Barcelona. What do you think accounts for this turnaround and is this a good move on their part in the current transfer market? I think uh, what accounts for it is a few, a few reasons. The first one, obviously, being that uh, the the market is not ripe for a a big money move, whether in or out, uh, because you're not going to get the money if you're selling, and you're not going to be, be able to spend the money if you want to buy. Even though Barcelona is sitting on a whole pile of cash, that's the first one. Then the second one is that Antoine Griezmann. They know what he can deliver. They know that he's a quality player, and they saw it in the last uh, outing, where I think it was it was uh, uh, the cherry on top was that grimy chip of a goal that he scored off an assist, a back heel assist from Leo Messi. So it looks like the, the, the front three that they want to click seems to be finding its its gear. Uh, and then thirdly, the, I think they, they want to show that Barcelona is one big happy camp. So this announcement also means that there's stability at the club. They're ready to move forward with uh, Antoine Griezmann as part of it. So it's an announcement that needed to be made because you can't have this talk going on to, into perpetuity. And Antoine Griezmann is a quality player. Keep him in Barcelona. Mike, if you take a look at Antoine Griezmann, um, the season that he's had with Barcelona, and um, the fact that he hasn't really in as much as they'll say these statements, you can tell that he hasn't really gotten into the Barcelona way of doing things, the Barcelona way of playing. Is it a good idea for them to keep him rather than to sort of uh, make some of the other deals that they had talked that had been talked about? For example, um, having him as part of a bargaining chip to get Lautaro Martinez to the club as well. 
is it necessarily a plan to keep a player who hasn't really gotten into the Barcelona way and it's very clear? I think there's uh, two ways to look at it because you could make a deal for Lautaro Martinez and he might not click as well. Uh, and in terms of uh, just uh, the gamble, it might be one not worth taking. I think Barry made the point that um, in this market, this is not a market for sentimentality. This is not a market for you to be taking your, your handbag and going shopping and uh, paying over the odds for players because um, uh, we're already beginning to see, I think the news that Wigan Athletic has gone into administration in England, which is a club that was on a sound financial footing just 24 months ago, just shows you that when the financial reports for the year 2019 come we're going to have a lot of surprises so i'm seeing a situation where a lot of clubs are going to try and hold on to the players that they have at least give it a stab for the next uh maybe couple of transfer windows and wait until uh the end of next season for them to know exactly where they stand uh, uh, financially uh, we saw matic matic has been given a, a new three-year deal at manchester united mm. why because you know what that's the situation right now. Instead of Manchester United selling him off like they wanted to do, because that was the plan, Matic was on his way out. He's been given a three-year deal because teams just don't have the money to spend. We're seeing the same noises coming out of Liverpool as well. Liverpool say, hey, we're going to do a wait and see. Timo Werner, you want to come here? We're not going to buy you. You can go to Chelsea. We'll wait and see until the situation becomes a lot clearer before we commit to buying players. So I think Barcelona are just trying to hold on to the players that they have. Griezmann, yes, hasn't worked the way we wanted him to work, but he's still been fairly decent in parts. And I think Barcelona would have been encouraged with the way he has sort of like performed this past week. Let's see how he does tonight on Barcelona take on Espanyol in the derby uh, and if they can build on that combination with uh, Messi and Suarez. Your results from last night as well. Valencia 2-1 against Real Valladolid. Celta Vigo and Atletico Madrid drawing one all. Your fixtures for tonight. Real Betis versus Osasuna. Getafe will take on Villarreal. Barcelona versus Espanyol. Tomorrow, Aiba versus Leganes. Mallorca takes on Levante. And Athletic Club versus Sevilla. Right, quick update as we wrap up the show. News out of Germany is that Borussia Dortmund have set the deadline and price tag. United must meet in order to sign Jadon Sancho. Sancho has emerged as the number one transfer target for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's side following a stunning season in the Bundesliga. The winger scoring 17 league goals and providing a further 16 assists for Borussia Dortmund as they finished runners-up to Bayern Munich. That price tag, £90 million. And they're given the deadline as the 10th of August to complete the deal. Shell out or shut up is the news coming out of the best balance study. <laughs> well, we are going to shut up. That's what we're going to do because we got to go. We'll catch you tomorrow for our short and show. May God richly bless you. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it. Manandi, out. <laughs> and it's messy. It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. The biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, on top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport on CFM Stereo. My station, your station.